Hi everybody, thank you for joining today's webinar. We are here to discuss the highly anticipated sustainability imperative part two prepared by WFW, which is gonna be published next week on the 23rd of March. Um, for those of you who don't already know me, my name is Lizzie Rowe. I'm a partner in the asset finance team at WFW based in our Singapore office. And I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of industry experts who are here to discuss some of the key themes arising from our upcoming reports. We have Martin Creswell, who's the technical director of the Hong Kong Shipowners Association and chairman of the International Chamber of Shipping's Marine Committee. We have Bud Dar, Executive Vice President at the Maritime Policy and Government Affairs at MSC Group. We have Paul Taylor, Global Head of Maritime Industries at SOCGEN and also Vice Chair of Poseidon Principles. And Gerbrand Vergott, Managing Director and Head of Transport and Logistics for APAC at ING. Um, as most of you may well be aware, WFW published a report at the beginning of 2021, which was based on a survey of over 500 senior figures across the maritime industry, which examined ESG in the shipping context and included some in-depth interviews from some experts in the field. Um, and it was very well received and provoked a lot of interesting discussion at the time. But we are very conscious that over the past two years, um, especially the aftermath of COVID, geopolitical factors, including the war in Ukraine and the ensuing energy crisis, the discussion around ESG has moved on very quickly in a short space of time. So we wanted to take this opportunity to review and consider how attitudes and perceptions to ESG have changed within the shipping sector, as well as looking at some of the key influencing factors around those changes and some of the challenges moving forward. And um, so we've conducted a follow up survey in October and November last year and some further in depth interviews, and that forms the basis of our latest report. So it's an extremely broad topic and there's lots that I'd like to um, pick the brains of our panelists of. So I'm going to jump right into the discussion. I think generally speaking, most people would agree that the main ESG issue which has been dominating headlines in recent times is the journey to net zero. Um, and although digitalization has an important role in order to increase efficiencies, Alternative fuels is very much at the heart of every discussion around decarbonisation. Um, so I wanted to start by picking up on one of the noticeable shifts in attitudes, which we noticed was highlighted in the most recent survey. So in the earlier survey, when we were asking ship owners what alternative fuels they were considering in the next five years, LNG was listed as the clear favourite. So around 60% of people um, picked that as one of the options. But fast forward two years and that response has fallen significantly. So only around 35% of the respondents picked that as one of their options. And I'd love to hear from the panel, um, did you find this result surprising? Um, and possibly what do you think some of the main reasons around this may be? Um, I don't know, Paul, do you want to kick off the discussion and let us know your thoughts on that? Thanks, Lizzie, uh, and morning, afternoon to everybody. Yeah, sure, uh, of course. Um, well, two years, the last two years have certainly been a long time in the shipping industry. So I'm not personally that surprised by, uh, by the, 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 the change or the swing in, in, in sentiment. So actually, 35% is, in most industries, is, is a very good figure. And so... 35% you know, uptake on LNG is, is actually very good. And we're seeing a, a lot of our main clients investing in LNG propelled vessels. So there, there's certainly no um, sort of stop in the, or um, slow down in the momentum of, of, of LNG in terms of in investment, in, in my opinion. Um, I, I, I think it actually says more about the momentum in the industry. There are multiple options available to, to ship owners. It's not like the aircraft industry, which just has one option. There are multiple options. And we're going to see an uptake of pretty much all of the options, I think, as, as they're rolled out over the next decade or so. Um, so it says more about the fact that ship owners now are 
already investing in methanol uh, vessels, not just methanol already, but methanol taking the plunge on the on the supply of, of, of fuels. Um, so I don't see any negativity there in, for LNG, more of a, a momentum swing for other fuels, certainly. Where, where LNG proponents have to be a little bit careful um, is that the industry is now looking on decarbonisation on a welterweight basis. And that means you're looking at um, CO2 equivalents, you're looking at emissions factors for the upstream emissions. And it's, it's up to the proponents of, of LNG uh, as a fuel to educate um, the industry on, on issues like methane slip to, to show that this is being solved. Because if, if solved, LNG has a huge role to play in, 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 in the transition, either as a transitional fuel or as a, a fuel in transition towards biosynthetic. So I think it's a question of lobbying and educating the fact that the issues that relate to LNG are being solved. Um, but 35%, that's not a bad, that's not a bad figure. That, that's very useful. Um, Martin, I know when we discussed earlier, you had sort of a, a few comments and viewpoints, sort of particularly from the technical aspect, and I guess tying into some of the comments Paul made about um, some of the concerns around methane slip and so on. Um, I don't know if you can share your thoughts with the panel on that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I agree with Paul's uh, views. But there are uh, some other issues. Um, one, of the, one of the main ones is um, the cost of actually fitting out a ship with LNG, very expensive. So smaller ships, um, basically bulk carriers, probably under under 100,000 or so, um, tankers as well, and smaller feeder container ships, et cetera. It's just too expensive to uh, consider LNG because you've got to keep it in liquid form at minus 162 degrees. That's a difficult thing. And it's quite interesting that quite a lot of ship owners actually who've, who've actually um, already got LNG on the ships, they actually didn't put cooling systems in their tanks. So that's made it very difficult for them. And also, they haven't had SCRs. So if they go to an eco zone where they need to meet tier three NOx conditions, um, they have to <laughs> burn LNG uh, to do it. So they've got to keep LNG in the ship, even though it's much more costly at the moment than actual fossil fuel. So there's a lot of issues. The, the other issue, of course, is the variable cost of LNG. It's, it's since the Ukrainian war, the price of LNG has soared um, and it's become very um, transparent that basically it's not going to be cheaper than fossil fuel probably for quite a long time. So there's lots of issues with it, LNG. And of course, the other things, of course, is exactly what Paul said about the um, methane slip, etc. And the other thing is the EU ETS scheme, I mean, they're going to include methane and NOx actually as part of their um, carbon initiative, well, basically produce greenhouse gases, they're going to be included in the greenhouse gases. Uh, the IMOs like to follow as well. So it's all looking a bit more difficult for, for owners who basically decide to go down the LNG route. That, that's very interesting to hear. Um, I just actually, Bart, I wanted to pick up on one of the points that Paul made and sort of, you know, commenting around the fact that while fewer people seem to be selecting LNG, partly that was because of the increase in other alternatives. Um, and actually one point that came out from the survey is on average people were picking around four fuels that they had under consideration as alternative sources, which again sort of highlights that question of, you know, which is the fuel of the future. Um, and just interested to know kind of what factors you take into consideration when you're thinking about which fuels um, you're using in the short term and also kind of in the longer term um, on the energy transition journey. Yeah, thank you, Lizzie. And um, forgive me, but I'm going to take a swing at finishing the last question too, just a little bit before I transition into this. And, and, and I think there's three basic factors here. One is the technology readiness of methanol as an, an alternative has increased substantially and predictably over the last couple of years. So it's offered another option that is as ready for market as, as LNG was as potentially. And then the second is the policy dynamics have shifted a bit. I think there's a lot of rhetoric about LNG, some of which founded in science, some of which not. And I think if you conflate the idea of fossil-based LNG with the future forms of bio and synthetic LNG, and it's not too far future. I mean, we're putting 
uh, bio LNG in the in the short term, um, very much on our radar screen. It's just limited uh, availability right now. Uh, but if, if, if you're not talking in terms of transitioning to bio and synthetic, you are pretty much talking about a shorter term solution. And, you know, Paul mentioned life cycle analysis. I actually welcome that because whether you're talking about uh, methanol or LNG, if you don't take into account the upstream part of the life cycle, you'd never really get the benefit on tank to wake um, that we need for, for these fuels holistically looking at it. So that leads into my answer to the question you actually asked me, which is uh, what factors do we look at? Technology readiness is one. And one thing that we tend to understate far too often in my opinion is uh, the safety aspects. You don't get any extra credit for operating ships safely. Don't get me wrong. It's just assumed, but I got to tell you, it's a huge assumption. And I know my company, we're not going to put fuel on a, on a ship that we're not convinced we can do safely. And with some of these alternatives, particularly hydrogen and ammonia, there are challenges there. They're solvable challenges, in my opinion, but they are significant safety considerations that must be taken into account. And when you do a proper formal safety assessment, uh, for example, I'm not ever sure you really get there for certain types of ships like, like cruise ships. It may be appropriate for other types for sure, um, but we really do need to take those safety aspects seriously. And it's not just the molecular part, it's not just the equipment part, but also the human element of this is extremely important. And we have to be mindful of that uh, for the future because there are still going to be um, seafarers operating our ships and they, um, they're they gonna play a, an important role for a long time to come. Uh, cost is obviously uh, you know, an issue, um, but you know, as we look at costs today, uh, you know, who knows if that's the same cost profile we're gonna see five, 10, 15 years down road, down range, but at least on the CapEx, there are some significant barriers to being ready. And, and, and it is true, as uh, Martin alluded to, that the, the, the cost of fitting LNG is substantially more uh, than it probably is for methanol because it's a more complex fuel uh, to handle on board. And then when you get into the OPEX, like I said, there's so many variables <clears throat> in that. I don't know. I just know we're going to pay more for the fuels of tomorrow than we were used to paying historically for the fuels of the past. And we all need to be ready for that throughout the value chain. So we're looking at those things. And then, you know, the availability is really at the end of the day, what our desire to decarbonize is going to turn on as to whether or not we can succeed. Because, you know, at the end of the day, this isn't about the best soundbite. It isn't about the next big proclamation that you know, 120 ship owners or institutions sign on to, uh, it's not about the aspiration. We're going to be judged on, did we in fact decarbonize? And we need to do that. Um, from the ship owner's perspective, collectively, we've been clear, we need to do that by 2050. Um, and, and that won't happen without the availability of the fuel. So as we look at fuel choices to go into our ship and equipment to accommodate it, the availability of those fuels is really key to it all because without the fuels, this is all just talk. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying about availability. I think one of the points you touched on as well was obviously pricing issues. And there's been a lot of discussion about the pricing gap in terms of green fuels compared to fossil fuels. Um, and this is something, again, that we looked at in the survey and sort of saw around a quarter of the industry saying that they feel that that gap should be um, addressed by government subsidies and investment. And a further 30 percent actually think the ship owners will end up footing the bill on that. Um, I'm curious as to what the panel think in terms of who should be footing that bill. And I guess as a follow on question, who will pay the difference? And, you know, it may not necessarily be the same answer for those two questions. Um, Gerbran, did you have any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, being a banker and not a ship owner or a charter, I thought about comparisons with other industries and Probably the best I could take was the automotive industry, because I think there we have already seen an acceleration, the uptake of electric vehicles. And I am very much in favor of government subsidies and government investment as a first start. Uh, it's, it's the incentive which gets um, demand and supply going. And 
when sufficient demand and supply has been created and the technology is uh, more accepted and people are comfortable with the concept, then you can easier take away subsidies or stop investments and let the market working take over. And those dynamics will create yeah, competition, new entrants will come in. Um, Ultimately, that will then mean private investment will be made. The owner, the operator, uh, yeah, will, will will further do its job. And ultimately, uh, costs are being priced in and the off-takers will pay for it. Um, if you look at, 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 at shipping, um, I think... Um, government subsidies and investments, yeah, you, you then make it local and not global. And I think that's a bigger topic. Uh, yeah, what role should the IMO play? Uh, what, lo what role should local governments play? Uh, but ultimately, uh, my view is that governments should make the first step. I understood. I mean, Bud is that, you know, obviously you go around looking at it with the banker hat on it, um, sort of owner or free side, is that, also how you see it? Well, ultimately, uh, the costs, just like the cost of everything else in running our business, have to make it into the marketplace and have to be borne by our customers or else we're not running a business, we're running something else. So we, we really have to keep that in state in mind and be prepared for that. Uh, just as I expect that it's gonna cost more money to heat my home and drive my personal vehicle, um, it, it's going to cost more money to, to ship goods, ultimately. Um, the you know, Putting aside the last couple of years, which were uh, extraordinarily unusual for liner shipping, um, ultimately, it's a very low margin business. And, and the costs aren't just simply going to be absorbed because uh, we have to get a reasonable return on capital in order to continue to provide those services. So I think the bigger question is really on what is the rate or the pace that society and in turn governments, you know, want the industry to decarbonize at, because I think the market on its own will probably choose a slower pace because the ultimate consumers of our services are, you know, not naturally going to accelerate at the fastest rate possible. Some of them will, but some of them will talk about it and not do it. And some of them just won't want to pay the extra money. So I think that's where governments can play an important role because subsidies are perhaps returning money that's raised through revenues in things such as an ETS or a global uh, economic measure through the IMO into narrowing the price gap will accelerate the energy transition on a faster pace. I believe we'll get there no matter what, but the natural market I think would go slower than it would without government support to accelerate that transition by, by minimizing the price differential. And then I guess just sort of talking about, you know, the, the market as a whole um, and, you know, sort of taking a bit of a, a change in direction and looking at different influencing factors in terms of decarbonisation and alternative fuels and so on. Um, I'm interested and in, but I'm going to pick on you again, unfortunately. Um, you know, to what extent do you think there's sort of a responsibility on the larger ship owners to start um, or, you know, to, to share some of the findings and the outcomes of their research to make sure that the industry as a whole is shifting because some of those smaller ship owners may not have the same sort of resources um, to actually invest. But obviously, you know, if we want to succeed um some of these targets in terms of net zero, it has to be a, a movement as an industry as a whole. Yeah, thanks, Lizzie. You're not picking on me. I mean, I, I, I very voluntarily joined this panel because, you know, I enjoy talking about this subject. I enjoy telling the story and I enjoy encouraging others. And I think along the line of encouraging others, certainly it's, it's my company's point of view and it's my personal point of view that um, the larger, better resourced companies have an obligation to help the rest of the industry decarbonize by sharing the knowledge that they've gained along the way. I mean, I think to some degree that will happen naturally anyway, because there's only so many engine OEMs and um, abatement technology OEMs and energy efficiency OEMs out there. And there's only so many shipyards and we have a you know shrinking number of classification societies. Um, 
it'll eventually get shared. But I think we have a special obligation as the larger ship owners to be transparent about what we're learning so that the rest of the industry, including those ship owners who may not be as well capitalized as a big company like ours is fortunate enough to be, um, to, to learn from that and, and, and benefit and join the energy transition. Because at the end of the day, we need to all get there, not just some of us get there uh, for this to work. And that goes not just for our sector. That You could say the same thing about society as a whole. And I think it's really important that we be looking at that holistically too and sectors learning from each other and government sharing amongst themselves and technology providers sharing so that we can ultimately get there as a complete society to net decarbonization which is what we need and hopefully we'll all get there by 2050 as i believe the shipping industry will very very positive and upbeat message um, Martin, is that kind of, you know, how you see it as well in terms of information well, yeah, sharing? So, yeah, sort of. Um, but for the average ship owner, who are not the size of MSC or Maersk or CMA, CGM, um, a lot of this information actually um, is held by shipyards where they're building their ships. So when MSC builds a ship in a, in a shipyard, a lot of that technology that Bud's talking about actually gets transferred to the shipyard. They may have their own special designers to help the shipyard, but ultimately the shipyard actually is going to be the, the um, recipient of this information. Um, classification societies also have this information as well, so they're going to share out this information. So it will actually um, cascade down quite quickly, I believe. I mean, actually, today, for instance, this morning, I was at an ABS seminar, technical seminar, which was mostly talking about all new fuels and the and, uh, new rules, et cetera, to deal with the new new rules, sorry, the new fuels. I said at a WinGD seminar this afternoon where the engine builder was telling us about what they're doing with all their engines to burn methanol, ammonia, and hydrogen. Um, so all this is all happening. It's all happening pretty fast, actually. And um, ship owners just need to be confident that actually the technology is there so they can go to a shipyard, order a ship, with a dual fuel engine and maybe also put in some tanks as well for the for their desired fuel but they're going to be more reticent about um changing over to new fuels very quickly because they're waiting to see what's happening and taking the last question for instance um you know should governments be subsidizing um new green fuels etc i think what's happening there is that um we're getting penalties i mean the eu is going to give us a penalty if you basically for the amount of greenhouse gases you burn on your ship come into the EU um, from anywhere in the world, and also if you, you transition around the EU, um, they're going to have also penalties. The IMO are talking about penalties and levy. So there's there's going to be lots of money brought in to the EU, to governments, to the IMO, which they hopefully will be dispensing out to. Uh, um, companies which want to create green fuels because that's the issue where the green fuels coming from because that is not clear at the moment although we have a I feel like we have a global bunkering system for LNG LNG isn't going to get us to 2050 um, but what we do need is we need the green methanols the green ammonias we need also green biofuels green LNG etc so all these are going to be very expensive to produce um, initially hopefully they're going to get cheaper as we go on but that needs to be kick-started, and we need money for that. But I'm not sure that governments, I mean, just looking at governments in the EU, for instance, I mean, they're not flush with money. They're in huge debt. Are they going to come out and give money for shipping? Shipping, And what about all the other industries, the cement industry, the steel industry? I mean, they produce more greenhouse gases than shipping. So I'm sort of a bit sceptical about the amount of money governments are going to throw out on shipping. So I think we've got to sort of, get the money ourselves from our own, well, if you like, the IMO, which we're all members of, all the, all the maritime nations are members of, that is certainly moving in the way of a levy and also um, also going to penalise um, greenhouse gases as well. So money will be available, just may take a little bit more time. 
That's interesting. And I mean, I guess just on that point around the access to financing, um, that was actually listed as one of the top drivers in the survey um, responses in terms of supporting <laughs> one technological improvement over another. Um, and also actually financiers were listed as having the most influence in terms of environmental issues. Um, so kind of looking you know, broadly around the subject of money and who has influence, um, clearly the financial institutions are key stakeholders. Um, and I guess this is a question more for, for the bankers, um, but do you think that banks could be doing more to support energy transition or do you think they're, they're already doing enough? Um, go around, do you want to start off and then I'll, I'll move to Paul? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, Lizzie. Well, first of all, yes, indeed, liquidity is a very powerful tool. And as ING, we realize that very much. And at an early stage, we uh, publicly communicated that, uh, yeah, climate uh, impact through financing is at the forefront for ING. And we called it the Terra Principles. And what it comes down to, we identified nine sectors in which ING is active, in which we think we can have the biggest impact in contributing for the bank to the net zero target by 2050. Now, shipping was one of those sectors, but cement, uh, power generation, aviation were, for example, also included. Now, we have made good progress so far on this and currently for five out of nine sectors uh, we're below the pathway set. Um, if you look at the nine sectors, um, for eight we have net zero targets. Shipping is the only one where uh, we have not yet um, come to that stage and I also take note here of the Poseidon principles. If you ask the question, do we do enough? Um, well, I think what you see is you've gone from the awareness stage to the understanding and action stage. And after, say, three years of collecting data as a bank from your clients uh, to yeah, make your analysis from the design and principles perspective, uh, we've taken our learnings and trying to improve. And I think something we did, uh, which I very much liked, uh, we actually hired uh, two colleagues, uh, we came, which came with a very different background in the TNL in the transport and logistics team. We hired a data scientist, and we hired a colleague from the industry with a background as seafarer and ship manager management. And what you see is that really has, in recent times, uh, created a very good dialogue internally in the team. And yeah, we're developing our own platform to better understand the, the mission's performance of the vessels we finance. Now, what you see, bigger picture as an ING, actually, we have integrated already uh, the climate alignment uh, in our commercial decision processes and credit processes. And would you historically yeah, uh, look very much at credit? And yeah, there we have a satisfactory track record uh, over the past decades. You now throw a new element in, which simply means if we have a new proposal, we have to show to our senior management uh, what the AER is for the asset uh, we finance. Um, if it's above the pathway, then we need to provide further explanation what the operator owner is going to do to improve it. If it's below the pathway, that's probably easier discussion. Um, I think for us, uh, you can always do more. But if I look at the amount of time spent uh, by well, the bank, the sustainable finance teams, uh, the ship finance teams, it's very, very considerable. And ultimately, yes, it's there for um, a good reason. Uh, I think it will accelerate in the coming years that we even spend more time on it uh, before we can yeah, uh, yeah, uh, take a slower pace. Um, and Paul, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well um, from, from StockGen's perspective. Uh, are the banks doing enough? Sure. Well, is anyone ever doing enough? But let me take a step back and I'll look at it from the market side. And then, I'll, of course, I'll make a comment on Sotgen. But make no mistake that I think that the Poseidon principles, which now has 30, 30 signatories, in fact, pretty much everyone other than the, the Chinese and the Koreans, um, is, is game. What, what's happening now with Poseidon principles is, is game changing. 
and we, we are we've gone from launching in 2019 where it was a measurement and reporting device for transparency and accountability and that has evolved to what is now or very shortly going to become um, target setting for many banks so formal target setting and this is because many many of the Poseidon principal banks are also members of the NZBA the Net Zero Banking Alliance which will require formal target setting not just for 2050 but also for on the pathway starting 2030. So any voluntary initiative uh, for uh, a certain sector such as the Poseidon principle is going to have to fit in with also the wider bank's um, commitments to an NZBA. So it's not just a question of measuring, reporting, it's a question of actually setting targets and if you set a target you want to hit those targets and if you want to hit those targets you're going to have to have a strategy and that's going to lead to change in lending behavior that, that can be the only outcome and whilst every bank who signed to the Poseidon principles will have their own business model and of course no one um, sort of discusses that within the Poseidon principles because each bank um, is their own um, we are all going to be looking very carefully at how we go about aligning ourselves with the new targets and as Gerbrand said we're going to be um, a lot more due diligence on the vessels we finance new and existing but also we're going to be looking at the the corporates and I think it's uh, much more important rather than being prescriptive and just looking at the the vessels and cherry picking which clients won't allow let's let's, let's face it you've got to look at the corporates the ship owners and you've got to look we, we are sort of going to rate you know all our clients uh, we're rating them on four pillars so we're looking at their commitment to, to net zero we'll be looking at their investments and actions to date we're looking at their carbon footprint we're looking at their sustainability reporting so and it, it's very much looking at our hybrid model of what are the corporate doing and what are the assets we're, we're financing so you know, are we doing enough um this is this is a pathway it's it's evolving but the first three years of reporting um under what is now a redundant IMO trajectory still shows banks as um, misaligned on that trajectory because there's a certain amount of volatility in the results which we're still trying to comprehend and establish trends but as we establish a much more ambitious trajectory this year which is a commitment of the Poseidon Principal Association which uh, may be one trajectory it may be two trajectories um, the only way banks can achieve that is by changing their lending behavior and applying capital to the best projects and, and, and the best clients. So are we doing enough? Probably not. It will take time, but we're doing um, an awful lot more, I think, than, than many of the sectors. Um, and we really need our regulator to step up and come out with some clear, concise um, regulations, which will be very helpful. Um, just on that that point that you mentioned on the Poseidon principles and sort of talking about, you know, there's obviously a huge number of banks that have signed up, but um, some of the Asian banks are not yet necessary signatories. And I think, Martin, that was something you were discussing when we spoke earlier. Um, you know, kind of what, what's your viewpoint on how that interacts with what's happening kind of more in the Asian context? Well, yes, thanks. Um, well, for my my perspective, basically, is, as as um, Paul said, the Asian banks, China and Korea, which actually are between them are building about 75% of the world's ships, um, their banks are not part of the Posidon principles yet. Um, they are actually financing a lot of ships. Uh, they've got a lot, I mean, China's got some very many, many yards, um, which they're busily wanting to fill. So their banks are quite active, actually, in lending money to ship owners who want to go and build a ship in China. Koreans are similarly sort of doing the same for their fewer yards, but they've got very large yards. So it, there is a sort of gap at the moment in this area. Um, I don't know whether Paul thinks they can be persuaded to join the positive principles or not, or whether they remain <laughs> out of it. <laughs> Well, one, one, remain, one remains hopeful, and um, no, we're going to we're going to try again. But it, it, it appears that at the moment, um, the, the the Chinese leasing companies, the the Korean ECAs have um, a, a, a different model. Um, mm. But I think over time, of course, we we very much hope that they will they will sign up because 
I think every responsible lender should be a signatory. Hmm. Yes, I think they have a different view, I think, because of the fact that they're building so many ships, whereas in Europe, they're not hardly building any ships. Um, you're just financing ships, which should be building in Asia mostly. Um, so they do have a different perspective that they want to fill up their yards. I can, un I, can un I can understand it, and I think, but mo most new vessels which have been built uh, and live today have hack eco friendly designs. So, hmm. actually, um, financing new vessels is not the issue, I think, towards um, hmm. decarbonization and aligning on a trajectory. It's one's lending behavior towards refinancing the existing fleet. And that is where we can, I think, all um, make, a, make a real um, statement mm. to the industry mm. by applying our capital to the most efficient vessels. And if that's the new vessels built in China and Korea, fantastic. Because And all the European lenders, we want to stay in business. We want to help finance those vessels alongside the Chinese and the, and the Koreans. But I think we have to take a responsible attitude to the, to the ship owners and their, their commitment and also to the existing fleet. Can I ask you a difficult question? Um, which is the cheapest financing available? Is it from banks in Europe or is it from banks in Asia? I mean, in China and in, in Korea, for instance. I th look, we, we all know that the Asian market um, is, but that's, that's European banks in the Asian market too. I don't think there is one lender or one set of lenders who mm. um, are providing cheaper finance than others necessarily. But we all know that the Asian market made up of Asian, European, US and other lenders is a particularly aggressively priced market today. Mm. Yes, um, okay. So just just mm. um, I guess I wanted to circle back on something that Gerbrand mentioned earlier when he was talking about kind of the influencing factors um, and mentioned specifically the role of the IMO. Um, and I'm, you know, sort of talked about sign principles. There's obviously a lot of other voluntary initiatives within the industry. Um, and I'm, I'm keen to hear sort of, do people feel like the IMO is doing enough to push the agenda forward? They need to be doing more. And should the industry initiatives and associations be the ones kind of driving and influencing the IMO? Or is the IMO leading the way and it's really just the industry initiatives to try and sort of implement um, those targets and measures? Um, I mean, Bud, maybe you can um, start with your thoughts on that one. Sure. Um, the, the first thing I'll say is when people that haven't spent time at IMO talk at IMO, the talk about IMO, they often miss the point that IMO is a collection of governments. The governments make the decisions. Mm -hmm. And so you can't look at them as if there's some third party bureaucracy in it. And I always kind of laugh out loud, sometimes in the face of mm. the speaker, when it's a government representative that complains about IMO, because a failure at IMO is a failure of the governments. Mm. Um, the industry's influence there is, you know, we, we don't get a vote. Uh, we, we get to express opinions after governments have spoken in most cases. Uh, but ultimately, it's the governments that make the choices. And one of the reasons why progress has always been slow at IMO on greenhouse gas reduction is it's really been a slave to the bigger dynamics of the geopolitical forces in play with the UNFCCC negotiations over climate change and equitable transition and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I... I I think to single out IMO and say they haven't done enough is too simplistic of a way to describe it. It's governments haven't done enough at IMO. And if you look at what ship owners have done, I mean, ship owners for since 2021 have been calling for net zero for 2050, one form or another. We've been calling for a global carbon price. We've been calling for, we're not really calling it a market-based measure anymore, but an economic measure to supplement the technical measures uh, that go along with it, governments haven't been able to get their act together collectively in the maritime space to actually meet the demand they should be hearing from the regulated industry. So, uh, you know, it's one of those kind of odd situations where industry is leading to some degree. And um, when I say industry, normally I'm thinking of ship owners, but let's look at it more broadly and to the question of, you know, are banks engaged enough? I can tell you as a ship owner, I don't know, there's 
probably not a week that goes by when I don't engage with one or more of our lenders talking about exactly this subject and them putting pressure on as well as, as they should, because they can help by uh, discouraging uh, those investments that they don't think are sound with regard to their climate change aspirations and obligations, but also encouraging and putting into the marketplace the capitals that needed that's needed to actually successfully make that transition. One last point I'll make is the metrics matter a lot. And some of the difficulty in applying the voluntary Poseidon principles that some lenders are seeing is really a function of how the metric is being applied. That metric, which is ultimately the AER metric, it has distance and, and uh, um, uh, distance in, and uh, uh, some approximation of size, usually dead weight tonnage, which is fixed in the denominator. That is reasonable to use as a benchmark, but it's limited as a benchmark. And you have to understand its limitations or you'll misapply it. It is inherently really insufficient as a regulatory measure. And I'll give you a perfect example that's really simple to follow. The cruise industry found almost the perfect solution. We are the third largest cruise operator in the world, so we were acutely on the pointy end of the spear here. Uh, almost the perfect solution in 2020 to reducing absolute emissions. We stopped operating. We pretty much shut down the fleet. The emissions were as low as they can ever get. It was some auxiliary emissions. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I see Paul laughing. He and I have discussed this. The CII scores or Poseidon principle scores, which would work on the same metric, were absolutely horrendous. And so I think you have to be really careful and think about what it is you're looking at as a regulatory a metric to really judge your progress on the continuum towards success. And I personally believe it's really encouraging to see focus on a greenhouse gas intensity for fuel metric being discussed. And it's put forward by the EU. I think it was a very positive contribution based on the fuel EU initiative. I think we'll get a lot more progress towards the real end state we need than focusing on an intensity metric, which frankly in 2018 was chosen because it was really hard to see a pathway forward and there wasn't much of a good story to tell. Um, and, and now there is a much better story to tell. We can see pathways. You see people like me and other ship owners that truly are optimistic that this can be done. In 2018, that really wasn't the case. I very right. much what you say about XE, and, and not that we finance cruise ships, but as a bank, we very much realize when analyzing the data, the AERs, that, yeah, it has its limitations. And it's then the next step, which is the dialogue with the operator, the owners, and other industry participants, where as a banker who yeah, know very little, you actually get some understanding and start to see where the challenges are, which parts can be controlled, which parts are completely outside the control and are subject to market circumstances, uh, charters. And for us, uh, yeah, I would say it has been a really good learning curve. And I mean, if you look across a team, I mean, we employ 35 people in the ship finance team globally not a single one of them will not have had a very uh, yeah, uh, deep look into uh, decarbonization, AERs and the whole Poseidon principles and ev everything which comes to it. And that's the part I really like that even though it's only for a limited number of years, it's really on the agenda and people start uh, yeah, to get together and think deeper. Okay. Um, I just, I'm very conscious of time. Um, I think we did say we'd leave a few minutes at the end for any questions that come in. Um, but one point I did want to quickly cover, because I know we spent a lot of time talking about the environmental part of ESG, and there's a lot um, to cover, and, and we could spend hours talking about that. But I just want to very quickly um, address so one of the points on the social side um, and something that came out again from the survey which was showing that while environmental aspects obviously remain very important 
Um, diversity targets, particularly when looked at in the context of board composition, um, actually had the biggest influence on decision making and particularly amongst the listed companies. Um, and so I just wanted to get the views from the panel. Um, maybe, Paul, I'll start with you on um, sort of, you know, whether you think that that's a, a trend that we are going to start shifting focus towards um, looking more at diversity and the social aspects. So just a minute to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I don't think this is a, a totally new, new new point, although I, I do um, see, of course, the, the, the focus on, on, on diversity at, at the moment. Um, everyone's been focusing on the E, I, I guess, of the ESG over the last few years, and there's been a little bit less focus on, 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 the, on the S. Now, the diversity is a, is, a, is a huge issue. Maybe we are all feeling um, the, the, the shift as such in, in a more acute way, but I'm not, I'm not really sure that it has changed that much. Of course, there's been systematic discrimination um, uh, you know, uh, throughout um, organizations and countries um, for, for years. Now it's been, there's an adjustment going on and it probably feels acute, but it's, it's only right that organizations and, and banks, certainly there's a, there's a huge focus on diversity at the moment. There's a focus on being an inclusive employer um, to do what is right and be, be fair, but it's not just about what's right and what's fair. It's actually looking at, um, you know, it's, there's proof that, that having a, a diverse workforce um, and a, a, a strong d &I culture actually improves the performance of a company, it creates more creativity, more innovation, and ultimately a more successful work, working environment and a, 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 a working organization. So yes, yeah, we're we seeing a shift, of course, and it's a very, very good thing. But I don't, when you're using the word shift, Lizzie, I don't think it means we're going to take our eye off the ball now on the E. That is a one-way momentum that is here to stay, but quite rightly, organizations across the globe are focusing on this very, very important point of diversity, yes. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely correct. It, it's it's not one instead of another. It's just, I guess, expanding the, the focus. Um, again, uh, we're sort of running up to 10 minutes before we're going to wrap up the, um, the webinar. I know there's a couple of questions that have come in. Before we get to those, um, I'm going to ask you just a quick fire last question. Try and answer in uh, 30 seconds or less. Um, our survey showed that across a variety of um, ESG goals, the expectation that the proportion of the maritime industry would successfully address these issues within the next five years has actually fallen since the survey was asked um, or, uh, at the end of 2020. Um, and I'm interested to hear from each of the panellists um, why do you think that was and what can we do um, to try and encourage a more positive response if we ask the same question in two years time? Um, Martin, do you want to take that very quickly? You're on mute. Oh, sorry, Martin, you're still on mute. Sorry, could you just repeat the question there? I was, I was looking at the, thinking about the other thing about the fuel metric. Um, yeah, I was just saying, um, so why do you think possibly that the responses in the latest survey um, show that the proportion of the industry expected to meet some of the ESG goals in the next five years um, has fallen compared to when the question was asked previously? Um, and what do you think maybe we can do to encourage a more positive response mm. if we ask the question again in two years' time? I think two years or two years ago, um, basically, the IMO, um, everyone was thinking about how to um, improve the environmental footprint of shipping, um, but they didn't know quite how. As we've marched on two years, it's now becoming obvious that it's going to be much more difficult than they thought. Um, so I think that's presumably why most people have decided that actually it's going to take longer um, and they're possibly a bit more hesitant about uh, thinking that they they themselves are going to meet him meet these requirements um but going forward i mean we've got to come up with some solutions definitely um and um going back to the sort of imo um although they 
they're a large organization, as Bud says, they're made out of made up of mostly government officials. Um, they are a, a lumbering elephant. Um, they are they are moving. I would say they're moving quite fast, actually, in comparison with what they've done in the past. So, well, hopefully, in July, MEPC eighty, we're going to get quite a long way down the track to um, basically agree on these um, uh, well to wake issues um, and also the levy issue as well. So I think things are moving quite fast there. But one of the issues, as Bud was mentioning, was about the um, the fuel index. And that is certainly the CII index is definitely needs to be readjusted. It's just completely crazy at the moment. I mean, you, <laughs> you're, um, you're sort of almost penalized if you carry cargo but you you actually get a better rating if you don't carry cargo so it's completely crazy um we've got one of our owners here in hong kong who's a very large bulk carry operator handy size bulk carrier and they pride themselves in having the absolute minimum amount of ballast so this is going against the grain i mean they that's what they want they want to earn money from their carrying cargo so that's what cii has got to be looking at now, I think it, but the thing is the, the IMO have actually agreed that. They've actually said, well, look at it again um, before 2026. So there's lots of work going on now to actually look at this and put in proposals. So hopefully things will um, come out the other end before 2026 with the good metric that we can use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bud, you're, uh, you're quick, quick 30 second answer. Sure, um, very quickly. Um, I think people have realized it's harder than it sounded um, a couple of years ago. Um, and now that you're seeing what it really takes, uh, some people maybe think uh, I'm not so gung ho about it. However, um, the response in the aggregate is, is counterintuitive to me. Cause I can tell you in the ship owner community that I work in, I mean, not just the echo chamber of our own company, but the community I work in, uh, whether it's BIMCO or ICS or other associations I'm involved in is extremely more bullish on making this happen. I mean, in the last two years, it's gone from, uh, do we really have to do this to what are we going to be made to do and how can we influence it to how are we going to get this done? And that is the focus that I hear in the ship owners community every single day. So I'm surprised at those results. And I'll tell you something I'd like to do is I'd like to speak to some of those people who were naysayers because I do think that it is possible, and I think it's more and more possible every day. But yeah, it's hard, and it's going to take a lot of capital, time, effort, and endurance to get there. Very upbeat, um, Paul. Your your quick fire answer. Yeah, very quickly. So yeah, it's, um, I think people have realised it's quite a tough gig this decarbonisation of the shipping industry. So you know, I take on board everything. Um, Bud has said about um, all the countries that make up the IMO, it must be really tough to make a decision um, that works for everybody. But I'm hoping that with MEPC 80 um, this summer, um, we get more than an updated strategy from, from the IMO. We need an industry trajectory that updates the existing um, one, which was set you know, a few years back. Um, I'm not confident, unfortunately, that we'll get any more than an updated strategy. I don't think we're going to get an updated trajectory, but that is really what this industry needs um, to get the momentum and I think restore the confidence of the industry that we can actually achieve what we're trying to do, which is reach net zero. Thanks. And Govan, do you have anything to, to add on to the uh, previous answers? Well, I, I think it's uh, as expected uh, with any challenge when you start, you might have an optimism because you don't know actually what it is all about. Then you go to the next phase and yeah, you realize it's a lot more complex and the more you know, the actually less you know. And I think we're probably in that phase. So I expect to actually see an acceleration in the coming years because when yeah we get that better understanding and right uh, alignment, then all of a sudden we see yeah we should see again that much more positive view. So looking forward to, to the next two years uh, for that. Thanks very much. And um, we just have five minutes left for some very, uh, very quick Q&A. Um, one of the questions that has just come in is, 
Given the relatively tight time schedule for imposing tighter environmental performance, um, what is easier to finance? Um, a better than average existing vessel or a new building vessel that might have even better environmental performance but might be expensive and become obsolete or even possibly underperforming halfway into its economic life? Um, I don't know, Paul, go around. That sounds like a question for... For a banker, if one of you wants to take it, yeah. Um, well, I'm happy to say that. I don't look. There is no prescriptive answer. Uh, um, I, I think, you know, in terms of the new vessels, if a bank like like Solgen, for example, we're 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 client driven, we're corporate driven in our in our approach, we will will bank the client. So if they are building a, a methanol vessel or when it's ready an ammonia vessel, you know, we will support that client. Um, if we think that their ESG rating through their commitments and their actions, et cetera, um, merit it. So we will certainly do the, the latter, the new vessel. But you know, likewise, we will finance the existing vessels, which, um, which you know, once again, if the corporate has got the right rating and the right approach and the vessels um, have a pathway to alignment going forwards, we'll, we'll do that deal as well. So the idea is not to be prescriptive and say, one or the other, but to look at the at the client. I I, I very much concur, and if I may may may, may add to that, um, if you make a decision on financing an asset, and as Paul said, you finance relationships. But if 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 you look at a specific transaction, it's the commercial rationale, it's the credit rationale, and over the past years the sustainability, the ESG rationale has come in. And I think for us, what is important is the actual impact of that specific transaction on the overall portfolio. Because what you actually see is if you take an AER and you that weight it across your portfolio, you might actually see uh, very substantial impacts of well, certain assets you finance. And that may mean that you still finance the asset, but maybe you share some of the debt with other banks, or maybe you uh, find another way to minimize the impact on the overall portfolio. But it's simply not a, a, a one metric, a one decision. And again, it, it, it's, it's having that understanding what your client is, is going to do longer term. And I, I, I think for us, if it's a new build or a secondhand vessel, uh, both were happy to discuss. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to squeeze in one last question, although we are starting to run out of time. And um, just very quickly, what is the panel's view on availability of money? Is the money not available or is it more a question of it's there, but there's more of a need and clarity on where to invest and finance and how to deploy it? Um, I don't know if who, who'd like to take that one. I'm happy to make a very, very quick answer to that one. Um, banks are under increasing pressure to be aligned and have a trajectory and, and, and set targets. If we set targets and we're aligned with those targets going forwards, the capital will be available for the sector. If we miss these targets or miss them with a material mark by a material margin, that capital will go to other businesses um, rather than shipping. So today there is liquidity in the market for sure amongst banks and alternative investors, but it's through action and responsible lending that will keep that liquidity present and that capital available to the industry. Great, yeah, thank I, you. I, I, might, I might just add, Lizzie, from a, a ship owner's perspective, we'd always welcome more capital. It's gonna be needed for sure. But I think it's more limited right now by uncertainty over the soundness of the capital decisions that have to be made um, in, in which assets to buy. Um, it, it is not a clear pathway forward. In fact, you know, we see multiple pathways uh, for our own company and um, the decisions you have to make today, think about a cruise ship, maybe a 30 to 40 year decision and think about what date that puts you at. Um, it's really speculative today uh, to do that. So 
you know, there's quite a bit of hesit hesitancy, particularly with the, the downturn in, uh, in uh, some of the markets that we're seeing right now uh, commercially as well. They're hard decisions to make, even if you did have ready capital. We certainly would welcome more, but I don't think it's so much a, a limitation on the lenders being unwilling as it is. These are just really hard decisions to make. Excellent. Okay, well, um, again, conscious of time, so I'm going to wrap up the discussion there. Um, first of all, an enormous thank you, um, Martin, Gerbrown, Bud, Paul. Really interesting discussion. Um, I wish we'd had longer. There's plenty more to talk about. Um, but, but thank you for your time and giving your views. And also thank you to um, all the audience participants who've joined. Um, apologies if we didn't get a chance to address your questions. Um, we will try and send a, a follow up afterwards. Um, just to say very quickly, if you haven't yet signed up to receive a copy of the Sustainability Imperative Part 2, then I would encourage you to do so. And there'll be a link in the follow up email circulated by the WFW team. And we also have some information on the LinkedIn page. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys reading the report once it's officially out there. And thank you again for your time. Bye.